I got a far better talk offer this morning, which I couldn't pass up. Uh, I met Paul in Shenzhen, China, uh, earlier earlier last year, and um, we both had really interesting experience over there. So I thought it'd be good to hear from Paul about um, some of the things that his experience looking at um, Chinese supply chain. So, so well, more of this is actually a this is mostly this is a talk that I gave from my local makerspace after I got back, because I had such a great time. I'm sure you did too. Um, how many people follow Dangerous Prototypes? There's a website, a great open source hardware website. You should all keep an eye on it. It's fun stuff run by people who do this stuff. And they've moved to Shenzhen. Um, and they've started, running they've started running courses in Shenzhen. Um, let me start this. Um, which is just across the border from Hong Kong. And I mean just across the border from Hong Kong. Uh, 30 years ago, it was a fishing village. Now it's a city of 10 million people, something like that. It depends how you define the border. It gets bigger. Like. It gets bigger every day. Yeah. Um, it is a very clean city. It's um, growing like crazy. It's got brand new subways being buried as we speak, um, and it's where an awful lot of the electronics that we work with um, comes from. Um, I, I build consumer electronics in my day job. We manufacture in Shanghai because that's where you go when you want to build a million of something. But Shenzhen is where you go if you want to build a thousand, um, because you can get stuff cheap, really, really cheap. Um, so how do you get there? Uh, mostly you fly into Hong Kong and come across the border. There's lots of different ways. Um, oops. I took the subway. And if you look down the right-hand side, there's a gray subway line. That's, the sub that's literally the train in the subway in um, Hong Kong. You take it to the end of the line. You get off. You walk up the escalator, through uh, the, the Hong Kong immigration, across a bridge, because there's a little river there, through the Chinese immigration, and then you get back on the subway on the other side. And if you get off, where is it? Here, you're at the markets where all the good stuff is. So it's, it's literally this subway line, the green line. It's that simple. Um, Christmas Eve, I was traveling with my family in Hong Kong. I went shopping. Um, now, one of the real problems with visiting China is um, visas and stuff like that. If you want a tourist visa, you can go do this. It costs you $150 in New Zealand. You have to send your passport away to the Chinese embassy, who will put a, a thing in it. You lose it for two weeks. It's a slightly scary thing to have to do, give your passport away. I presume it's similar in Australia. Anyone done that? Yeah. If you want a business visa to visit China, you need an invitation from a company. But there's one really cool thing you can get, and it costs about the same as an American visa. Oh, sorry, as, a, um, as, as getting a single Chinese tourist visa. It's an APEC business card. Now, it's 150 bucks in New Zealand. You don't have to send your passport away. You have to convince the government that you travel in Asia for business. This is a free visa to all those countries on the back, including China. You don't have to pay anything more than that, 150 bucks for um, four years, I think it is, or three years. Very great thing if you want to go travel. You don't have to do any, do any deals with the Chinese government. You just show it at the border. It also gets you through the crew line at San Francisco Airport and LAX. <laughs> <laughs> So you don't have to wait. It's not a good. It's not a visa for the U.S., but as Australians and New Zealanders, you can get a, 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 a three-month visa anyway at the door. But it avoids that two-hour line that you often find if you get there during rush hour. So there is a bunch of there are issues with travel, but um, once you can get into China, you can have a great time. Um, the trip we went on was organised by the Dangerous Prototypes guys. Um, for some reason um, SVG and um, there's other people, SVG and Open Office don't have all that sore backwards for some weird reason. Um, Ian at Dangerous Prototypes organized this. For a long time he lived in Amsterdam. He moved to Shenzhen a few years ago because of all the cool stuff that's there and he now lives there full time. Um, the main reason to go are the markets. There are electronics markets galore. You have never seen anything like this. Um, you can walk through, there are buildings where they sell stuff by the million of, million of, hundred thousand of, something like that. There are other ones where they sell by the thousand of or a hundred of. 
So you have to go buy the right things. They'll offer you different prices in different places, obviously, and they'll probably tell you to go away um, if you um, try, and, uh, try and order too little in, at the wrong place. There's a whole street of markets. This doesn't show the markets on the next streets over. This is, I think, I think these are Bunny's pictures, actually, and this is his hand-drawn diagram of where to go. There are LEDs, there are parts, there's this enormous tower. This is the SEG market, which is the most famous one. Um, they just go on and on and on. I've been buying at these guys on the left, which are where seed buy their parts, I'm told, reliably told. You can buy reels for, for $2 each, so that's a reel of 5,000. I brought back a quarter million resistors <laughs> for 50 bucks. <laughs> um, look down the bottom here. Um, they just go up and go up and go up. You, you want to buy uh, switches and you want that little switch that feels just right, you can go down and you can ask to pick them up and push on them and check the feel of the switch. And I go in with the part I want and walk around with it and say, I want to buy a thousand of these. And you can do that. I did that with USB stuff last, week, last month. Um, none of these pictures really do um, justice. Apparently they don't let you take pictures in there, so I didn't try. These are other people's pictures. They're kind of suspicious about people who are taking photos. There are security guards um, who apparently get stroppy. I didn't really court things. We also visited the dodgy cell phone market, um, which we were, we were, my hotel was close to. It's a very interesting place. It sort of starts at one end with people selling bits on the street to try and sell them into the market. Dead cell phones go in one end and they get knocked down into parts. Um, and sort of in the middle, people sort the parts and check them to see what's good and take them apart and you get the idea, right? And then further down, you know, they've got all the parts knocked down and categorized and people are, uh, there are little stalls and people are selling them to other people and there are all these guys here are putting them all back together again. Um, and they're they're reballing the, the BGAs and at the other end they're, they're selling cell phones. <laughs> now you might want to buy one of these cell phones because they tend to be bizarrely rebranded with different cases and there are people selling circuit boards and um, you know, it was built that morning. Um, but if you're in a third world country, this is, n it's not just China. If you go to India, people fix phones. They don't just throw them away when they're dead. And if you throw your phone away and someone says they're, quote, recycling it, chances are it's going to Shenzhen or somewhere like it. And your phone will reappear in pieces in three or four other phones somewhere else. And so this is what recycling is. This is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, you have no idea of the quality because you don't have no idea of the guy who actually put it back together, right? He might have been an expert or it might have been his first day. Um, so a, a lot of what we were there to, to do was to learn about doing business in Shenzhen and we learned a bunch of little things from them. Um, carry a calculator. If you're going to do business in the market, they, they may not have a lot of English. You may not, may not have a lot of Mandarin or Hakka or Cantonese or whatever the person you happen to be talking to with speaks. But you can write a number on a calculator. You can point at something that you're interested in. You can say, I want a thousand. And they'll pick their calculator up and give you a price. And you can say yes or no and say yes. And they'll go off and get them. Um, it's very simple. You don't have to have a lot of language. You just have to be able to get up there and walk around and see what you like and what you want. Um, I talked about visas already. Uh, they told us a lot about starting companies in China. There's a bunch of different options. I, I won't go into them because I haven't gone that direction yet. I'm going to go and do a build uh, in, in probably next month or the month after. So I'm going to have to probably not start a company, but at least have my company doing some business in China. Um, there was a lot of street things. Um, there are electric bikes and taxis everywhere. The electric bikes sneak up on you when you can't hear them. Um, there, are no, uh, there are no motor scooters, no motorbikes in Shenzhen. If you've been to other Asian countries, you go to Taipei, it's a cloud of black uh, two-stroke smoke. There are mot motorcycles everywhere. They have banned all mo uh, gas-powered motorbikes in Shenzhen and scooters. There are only electric bikes. 
and they have about 10%, I think, maybe 20% of the cabs now are electric. There's a tax on petrol powered cabs. You pay less in an, in a, an electric cab. So you catch, the, people fight for the blue ones, I'm told. Um, there's a great subway. It's white and clean and new and cheap, really cheap. The traffic is amazingly polite. Um, we have the stereotype of Chinese drivers. I have no idea where it comes from because I, the people we, the drivers I saw in Shenzhen give way to pedestrians all the time. I, I, I think it's a, in China proper, we, they have a, these are first generation drivers. They were all pedestrians a generation ago. So people stop for you um, in a way that people are maybe not, you're not used to in other, again, other Taipei or Hong Kong or somewhere like that. The food is wonderful. And I had this bizarre, I, I, I have a beard, right? And people were continually stopping me and taking photographs. People would sneak photographs in restaurants. I'm strange. I would buy stuff in the market and I would have my photograph taken with the stall holders because of my beard. Um, they, you know, people just don't have beards and I was unusual. Um, I had the same experience, by the way, on Christmas Eve, but with kids who thought I was Santa. <laughs> now I've trimmed my beard, it was actually a little bit, little bit longer, but um, it's really bizarre. Um, there are other things um, you have to get used to. Um, if you do go to China, you should carry, if not toilet paper, something that will substitute because it's not necessarily provided in public places. You're expected to provide your own. It's just a different way of doing things. And if you're not prepared, you will be disappointed. Um, we also went to a soldering class where they taught us how to reball BGAs. But yeah, there we, yeah, there we go. There you go. <laughs> um, this was just amazing. You know, this is what the, these are the guys who teach the people downstairs. And we basically started off with. Um, and I took some little pictures here. We started off with with some cell phones and we took the the, the BGAs off, and then we scraped all the balls off the BGAs. Um, and cleaned them up and got rid of all the epoxy and stuff. Um, and then they gave us these um, little stencils and you basically put solder paste over the stencils, heat it up to about the right temperature and then it pops off and the balls are back. You know, you don't have to buy a reballing machine or anything like that. This is how they do it. They've just, someone has figured out their own way of putting balls on BGAs. So I, I tried to take a picture of the master doing it where he actually took a, he, didn't he take a, it was a, he took a CPU off an iPhone 5 yeah, and put it back on? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this guy can, can remove um, CPUs underneath shields without removing the shield around the outside and then put it back on again. I, With no microscope, not, not even a magnifying glass, it just doesn't yeah. make fair eyes. Yeah, I mean, I, I do most of my, my eyes are crap. I do most of my day work under a, under, under a microscope, but absolutely amazing. Oh, by the way, um, Ian is going to run another set of these early this year, or I'm um, sorry, I think April, May, if anyone's interested. Um, how much did it cost? I can't remember. It wasn't much. It, it, was, it was in the order of hundreds of dollars. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 plane, the plane trip cost yeah. more, the visa almost cost more. Yeah. It's really worth doing. You end up meeting an amazing bunch of people. The food is wonderful. Um, we also went to Make Affair Shenzhen, which I think I have pictures for here. Oh, so this is what I brought back with me. As you can see, I, I bought a bunch of resistors, a lot of resistors. Um, I bought a whole lot more while I was on. <laughs> um, I, and I bought a bunch of, uh, just a whole bunch of other, other bits and pieces. And we got given a bunch of things as well. I mean, I bought static proof bags. I know that's a silly thing to buy, but they were stupidly cheap and every, I was going to be shipping some stuff and needed a bunch of static proof bags in my storage. And I, this is a tray of USB connectors. Um, I think they were six, six cents each, something like that. Uh, these, are, um, these were two dollars each for 5,000 uh, 603s. Um, so you br bring an extra suitcase. We'll buy one there. <laughs> um, so Shenzhen Maker Fair was on afterwards. I, I went there for a day. I, I was kind of, I'm still limping and I, I've been, I broke my Achilles a while ago. I was just mobile for this. So I only managed to make it around the markets as it was. 
it was raining and I didn't do a lot there. So the Maker Faire was just um, also pretty amazing. You know, there's an awful lot of people doing stuff and it was outdoors. That was the, ama the other amazing thing. They had just grabbed some outside space and put up canopies and it rained, which was sad, but there were lots of kids, lots of grandparents and kids. Did you notice that? Did you, do you guys go? There was lots of grandparents took, taking their kids there. Um, and all sorts of, just all sorts of things, people showing off, you name it, they were showing it off. Um, I think I have one more picture. Lots of people with their 3D printing stuff. Oh, and Bunny was showing off his laptop. He had announced it while we were there. Um, I like this little guy at the top, which is a little um, xylophone robot. <laughs> So that's what I have to talk about that. The other thing I thought I could talk about if people are interested is um, I'm going to talk about this thing on Thursday, which is an open source um, random number generator that we're currently kickstarting. But is anyone interested in kick doing kickstarters and what that's like? Because I've just gone through the process. I, I, I don't really have a lot to say other than I chose Kickstarter. I probably would choose someone else next time. Um, not because Kickstarter is particularly bad, they really hold your hand. They, you know, it was really quite easy to do it. Making the movie was the hardest part because it turns out that Ubuntu broke all the libraries for outputting movies from any of the Linux movie makers. And I couldn't make my, couldn't get my, my movie out with sound without finally rebuilding my entire laptop in the process. Um, the main reason I wouldn't use Kickstarter again is that they only let people buy one of something. You can't have someone who says, gee, I really want to buy uh, that thing and that other thing you have, those other three or four things. And so I got a lot of grief from people who wanted to buy more, which is not a bad place to be in. Um, so I did get to add extra multiples. Kickstarter won't let you sell more than 10 of anything. And I understand why, they, they, they don't want to be in the production business, and, but we're all kind of a little bit more in that world. On the other hand, you know, I'm bringing out a new product, I probably don't want to give people more than 10 of anything up front, I want them to try it out. I want to use Kickstarter to get them to try it out and love it, and then come back and buy it from me, buy more from me later. Um, so our plans are to build a, a small amount of our product up front, we have a we structured it with two levels of um, rewards, one of which was um, one of which was um, um, how do I explain it? One of which was basically we're going to make them in a month or two. I'll order the parts at the end of next week because that's when the Kickstarter closes. We're still running. Um, the uh, the other one we're going to go to China and we're going to manufacture probably a thousand units and uh, probably about 500 of those will go to the filling Kickstarter orders. Um, and we're going to use all of our profits, such as they are from the Kickstarter, to fund building extra units so we can bootstrap a business out of that. Um, I'm not going to quit my day job. So how are we doing? Just a minute. I can't find it. Here it is. How are we doing? There's my dashboard. So we're about two and a half times what we ordered. Oh, sorry, so what we needed to be viable. Um, just to give you an idea, you know, this is going to be hard. Here we go. This is, this is what Kickstarter let you play with. You don't get to see this not as a... Um, there's how our sales have gone. <laughs> um, I don't know what you're laughing at, all the strongs. Yeah. <laughs> um, we, we made our, um, it took us six days to fund our product. We, we announced it at KiwiCon. It's a security product. We actually did a product announcement at KiwiCon, which is just weird. Um, and we funded it in six days and we were just completely blown away. You can see it slowly tapering off. We kind of figure um, at the end of the month when we stop, it'll be at about 30,000. $30,000, which is more than enough for us to bankroll a, a, a product build in China. Um, so we're really quite, really happy about that. Um, more importantly, does anyone have questions? The back. Um, your estimated $30,000, is that going to be 
Pardon? Your thirty thousand dollars is that going oh, to work? Yeah, we're, we're, we're kind of ignoring that issue. <laughs> 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 um, to be fair, we're, we are building a, a product that um, basically makes noise as its main product. You know, designing circuitry to make noise is, turns out to be much harder than you think. Um, but you have to worry about keeping it inside the box. Um, one of the points of our product is we want people to be able to open the box and look inside it. That's a tinfoil hat you can take off. You can look inside and make sure you've got the circuit I shipped you because there are big three letter agencies who want to change what you get. So we're, I mean, we're, we're selling a slight, slight bit of paranoia for you. Any other questions? I was just gonna, going back to the Shenzhen thing, I was just gonna second your recommendation to people visit Shenzhen yeah, and so also mention- He's just saying, second again, go take Ian's trip to Shenzhen. It's, it's, it's a real blast. It's worth it just for also, the food. It's worth it just for the food. Your electronics is a bonus. Also, yeah. I have a small collection of dodgy Chinese market novelty cell phones and some Reball uh, BGA chips. So I'll try yeah. and bring them to the box at this time. Yeah. And take them apart. Yeah. Yeah. Um, anyway, so I think there is there's some, there's someone else who's gone here, so I should get out of the way yeah. and okay. get them raised here. So, DP is up next. Um, we're going to be talking about LEDs, hair, and beading. Coming from a man who works for a company that means you should know what he's talking about. Well, I hope I do. Do you need to use your own? No. Um, yeah, this is the question. Yeah, this is the question. The LEDs are not. Um, the next slide is on. Yeah, the horrifying thing is all this stuff is floor sweeping. It's over there. Wonderful. Can I see the bit down in the bottom corner? What? Oh, it's being obscured. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing there. Um, what I'm trying to do and get is get to these what because. Resolution is that? <laughs> now you're asking me a difficult question. No, it just worked. Indeed. 
Um, let's, let's give up on the mouse, that one to start with. If you go in 1024 by 768, it will yeah. show the whole thing, but if you use larger resolutions, you get bits cut off left and right. Yeah. So. Right, now where the hell are these me mouse back? Right, I want this system up there. That beast here, yep. right. Uh, and oh, settings, system settings. System settings. Displays. displays. Now, if you put this back in, you'll be able to use the second display. Okay. Okay, just click on that one. Won't that be fine? Okay. Okay, and that means apply. I can still that's that to apply that, that one. one. Yep. Yep. And you should be able to you won't see that down there because this is actually a second display, so yeah. it's to the right. So you can actually drag this window here. Yeah, so I pick that one up, pick that up and take it out there. Okay. I'm over there. Then find out how to drive this thing, where the hell is my mouse? Um, it's probably on this screen, so you'll have to okay, go to the right. Okay, go to the right. Hit slide show. Start from the first slide. Right, blonk. Now, just right key go backwards. Never used this before in my knife. If. Okay. Cool. I think. Hi, I'm Digby Turner. I work for a company called Heller who make lights, mostly for aftermarket vehicles or navigation lights. And, and the electronics factory that assembles all this lives in Waihe, two hours that away. Nice little country town, not even a set of lights. All right. Most of you are probably familiar with this sort of LED, your normal indicators. You'll be running them at 5 to 10 milliamps. They show you something's on, something's off. If it's on the circuit boards, those are 0805 chip LEDs. But if you want something a bit brighter, these, one, these are what they call a piranha shape. They're a through-hole LED, quite a bit brighter normally running at somewhere between 30 and 50 milliamps, so you've gone up by a factor of at least 10. Then you move on to... Eh? So what's the scale? Um, as I said... Where is it? The reason I bought this lot was that you can see the real thing. Somewhere in one of these containers... There's your piranha LED if you want to have a look. Yeah. As I say, the floor sweepings, if you've got a real use for them, help yourself. These ones are surface mount. They're about yeah, yay big square. Reasonably bright, running again something less than 50 milliamps. And you, uh, you're probably familiar with what they call the star LED, which is these beasties on a little aluminium base. It's a K2 LED, no longer ma manufactured. Instead, uh, one of the things to deal when you're dealing with LEDs, there's a, you find a data sheet. This one's useful and it has all the useful information I want to look at on one page. It's actually a fairly old blue LED, 3 millimeter, one point two candela, I and mean, only 1.2, not terribly bright, but the important bits of information are maximum current, exceed it and you start killing the poor beastie. One of your problems you're dealing with with LEDs is they are a, a constant current. What I didn't manage to do was draw myself a graph showing your typical turn on for an LED of voltage versus current voltage versus current, whichever way. Nothing happens until you get to the knee, it goes around the knee and then the current goes through the sky. So you want to, for controlling an LED, you're actually controlling the current rather than just the voltage. As long as your voltage 
hits your typical turn on, so blue LED is similar to a white LED. It's just that it's got a lot bluer and then they put the same um, phosphors over it as they put on fluorescent lights. Now we're moving into the next generation. These little beasties, I mean there's some of them over there, are called a golden dragon. And they are typically running at 350 milliamps, so we've gone up by another factor of 10. They're fairly bright. These things are very small, but also very bright. Give a quick demo. This is a reversing light. That's the guts of a reversing light. This should be able to work. Where's my lead gone? fairly bright. Then you put a lens in front of it and concentrate the light and you've got a good backing light. Up. <laughs> Dang. Stay. Put that into there. Now we move up to the, the next generation. I mean you can see the, the bottom of one up the top there. Your contacts are on the left and right. The center is connected to some heat sinking. You're talking about 350 to one amp for these beasties. How big are they? I mean, have a look at them. They're in one of those jars over there. They're about uh, five millimeters on a side. Fairly small. Well, I, I'd have said damn bright, but those ones that I, the first one I showed you is the next generation again. So if you're playing around with these ones, you put them onto the, some modified star bases, which gives you a decent heatsink connection. One of the things you've got to ch deal with when you're dealing with bright LEDs is you've got to get rid of that heat. They generate a reasonable amount of heat. Heat will kill them. If you look at the specifications for any of these LEDs, the specification is at 25 degrees C. Sometimes you're lucky, they'll tell you what, what sort of light output you'll get at, um, at, at 80 degrees C. But the difference can be, the difference between, I mean, one of the LEDs I haven't got to yet, is 240, can, uh, for 240 lumens as against 280 lumens when you take, if you take the temperature up, you've come down by 40 lumens. The higher the temperature, the shorter their life, basically. The cooler you can keep them, the longer they'll last. Keep these beasties cool, and 50,000 hours is what they're estimating you'll get out of them. I mean, damn it, that's half a lifetime. Okay. Put the lights in your house and... And when you say cool, do you mean the LED has to be below 80 degrees? Yes, you try and keep the, the, the base of it below 80 degrees. Internally, it might be upwards of 150. But as long as you keep it at as cool as you can keep it, basically, and this is one of the reasons why you, you're controlling current, not worrying about, as long as you've got enough voltage there, control the current, because one of the problems is they have a positive temperature coefficient. The warmer they get, the lower the voltage, and if you're voltage controlled, the more current they draw. The sky is the limit. Right, I got here. This is that beastie that I was showing you that I lit up the first time. That's the footprint. It's about a year. Here's a couple of them. You can pass these round. Look at the, the circuit board. You'll notice that the front is connected to the back with I'll shove them both ways. With a whole pile of wires. The board is then mounted on a heat sink. That's that's part of a prototype that uh, we had mm, something like a 20% failure rate on first time we'd mounted these LEDs, they were a pain. We've since solved that problem. But again, you're looking at something that's probably five millimetres on a side, and there are your power contacts, and that's your heatsink. 
the heat sink is isolated from the rest of the LED. Um, I have seen a product that they were putting this thing in, 12 LEDs in a row, with, LED, with lenses in front of it. They made one to see if it would work and decided that it was too damn bright because this was what they were going to call high beam. Shine it 100 metres away and you've got a patch of light 10 metres across and about 3 metres high. It's a tad bright and half of that is the, are the lenses that are in front of it. Right, what are we trying to launch? Oh. This one's a little bit bigger. There are some couple of samples in the little red box that you can have a look at. So he, he's eight or nine millimeters on a side. Maximum current, three amps. It's generating a fair bit of heat, but oh, we test them at 50 milliamps. They're normally built on circuit boards which are aluminium, not your standard fiberglass. You've got an aluminium substrate, insulations, tracks printed all on it, because you've got to get rid of the heat, but whew, are they bright. Okay, enough of looking at the pretty pictures, as I say. If you want to have a look at some of them, they're all, there are samples of all that stuff there. Now, controlling these LEDs. Simple way, constant current source. Simple constant current source, use an LM317 regulator. Any of you not familiar with it? Most of you probably not. It's a voltage regulator. It's a requirement between the input, the output, and you've got a sense line. The voltage between this point and this point wants to be 1.25 volts. So normally you have a resistor from there to there, a resistor from here to ground, and that sets your output voltage. Or you pass the current through it. When the current across the resistor is 1.25 volts, you've got a constant, constant current source. Nice, simple, easy, and if you look at this one, that little extra board there is one of those. In fact, that gets the hottest of the, that particular combo, but it was just to demonstrate how bright it is. Now, if you want to control your actual brightness so that you've got a variable brightness lamp, you need to add an FET into the circuit and pulse width modulate it, or you can actually go backwards in technology Simple transistor circuit. The bias for the transistor is set by two diodes. The reason being that's one diode's worth there, so the voltage across that at the current you want is equivalent to that second diode, 0.6 of a volt. Some voltage current through there to turn the base on. Now you can feed your pulse with modulation in here. As long as you've got enough voltage, you can drive however many lamps you want to. Depending on the, the temperature, or not really? Yes, it, it, that, that it will vary. Point. I mean, for white LEDs, you're looking at anywhere between 2.8 volts through to about 3.2 volts. And that's why you Hotter it gets, the lower the voltage dropped across the LED. Right, and that's why you can't just put a resistor as a current in it. So the, the reason for the resistor is this is actually, if the current through this resistor drops more than the equivalent of one diode, you start turning the transistor off. So you end up with a constant current source. Mm -hmm. As I say, because you're controlling the base of it, pulse would modulate that and you can vary the brightness, just do it fast enough. Or we can move up, uh, when I was sort of throwing this talk together, I thought, okay, how can I talk about switch mode power supplies? I mean, most of the LED lamps, the big ones you'll see, have a switch mode power supply. And then I'm looking at Hackerspace one morning and somebody is using an atmel, tiny atmel, to drive his string of LEDs. And he's only going to be running, oh well, no he's not, he's running half a dozen LEDs here. What he's got is what's called a boost circuit. So you can play around with this one. Actually, having seen this, I thought, oh, I don't have to have a hack with that. So I started playing around with things. So let's look at the classic switch mode power supplies. This one's called the buck. Feed a voltage into the top. When you turn the power on, the current starts flowing in the, the inductor. Your inductor value is such that you start to store magnetic energy in there because inductors don't like sudden rises in current. They'll allow it to rise slowly and they store energy. Turn it off. 
And the inductor says, you can't do that, and keeps pushing current out. That magnetic energy goes away again, and so you get a current through the net, through the LED, which you can now sense here. Voltage drop across the resistor to control your pulse width modulation, so you've got a feedback loop. To keep the current flowing, it sort of goes somewhere, so it comes back through a Schottky diode, one of your high-speed diodes. So the current flows around that loop when that's turned off. When that's turned on, it's providing the power. Don't turn it on permanently, you'll just uh, let smoke out of the LED. But that's your classic, what they call a buck circuit. It drops voltage. It doesn't get hot because there's no, there's, there's nothing there dissipating heat. You're converting the current pulse into magnetic energy and then getting that energy back again. Make sense? One of the fun things I discovered when looking around was, would you believe that's the same circuit? But where I got this one from is there's a nice little chip, you know, about the AB with five pins on, that has the sense resistor on two of its pins, drive your LED, the inductor hang under a couple, the switch is built into the chip. Now the nice thing about that is, if you go back to that previous one, it's using a P-fit. Driving the big heads is a pain because they're a high side switch and you've got to have the voltages right and if you do it wrong and you fry the fit. In fits are an awful lot easier. Most of, them, most of the common ones will turn on with three to five volts so you can just feed the output of your micro, 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 micro processor straight to it. If you're doing it this way, actually it's easy to apply the chip. The chip does it all. <laughs> um, if I could figure out how to switch from this to my other screen, I could um, show you a, the, the, the um, data sheet for that particular chip. Once I finish this, I'll go and dig, dig it out. But this makes a nice, easy system. In fact, somewhere amongst my junk, I've actually lashed one together out of more bits. And I had a lot of fun with it and discovered the problem I had was that the micro I was running only had a six meg crystal on it. Fastest pulse with modulation I could crank out of the chip. Same as the Arduino was um, 23kc and the inductors I started playing with were in micro henrys because that's what most of the stuff we used to work but the stuff at work is running at hundreds of kzs up to megahertz I eventually got some some mini henry chokes and oh, they worked the way it was needed to they had a lot of fun playing with this I mean I know all the theory and I know how it works and actually sit down put some together and see how it works it was fun having Run, this is for running single LEDs. You're dropping voltage by using the inductor to store energy so that you're taking away that extra voltage. Now we go to the, to the other way. This is your classic boost circuit. Instead of one LED, I should have drawn 10 of them there. What you're doing is turn on, turn on your FET, again, the NFET, easy to drive. Current flows through the inductor, builds up the magnetic field, turn the FET off, it's got to go somewhere, so it cranks up the, the capacitor. And as long as it hasn't exceeded the voltage required to drive your 10 LEDs, 3 volts each, i.e. 30 volts, nothing happens. Keep pulsing away, that energy builds up on the capacitor to the point where you turn the LED on. Keep thrashing it along, you're driving 10 LEDs with 5 volts. A standard boost circuit. Most, I mean, that um, reversing light is, is using a boost circuit. There are strings of, I think, five LEDs. Maybe, yeah, five LEDs per string or something like that. <coughs> so, from a voltage, using a suitable switch mode power supply, you can generate. There's enough, enough voltage as long as you're controlling. You've got the sense resistor in there. So you've got a feedback to control the current. So your, your standard chips, of which there are plenty of, uh, quite a range of them. Got to grab the right piece of paper that I haven't, haven't had a file listed on. But they're about common. If you're into driving LEDs, you'll find standard lead drivers I mean, if you look for LED driver and automotive, you'll get ones that can handle 
the voltage surges that vehicles produce. And vehicles are nasty things. You think, it's a 12 volt battery, it's a 12 volt system. No, you've got to be able to handle 40 volts. And I think that's that pile. Now, how do I get it? Escape gets me out of that one. Yep, um, we can stop there. But So, any questions? I mean, basically I'm just giving you a bit of a rundown on what's required to drive bright LEDs. Driving a simple indicator, the yeah, resistor will do the job. You only want 3 5 milliamps through it. When you want bright lights to light up the house, the house truck, whatever, you're starting to move into switch mode power supplies and all the hands will beat around the ear because you're generating all this noise. I think the NJK gets strips of LEDs in a metre long or so and they run off 12 volts. They've got resistors in series. Oh, okay. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, so, so you take you know, a couple of three LEDs, there's a string of maybe three LEDs, you can chop it into pieces. And there's probably three LEDs in a string. Okay. So three wide LEDs, that's nine volts, throw on a couple of resistors. You're wasting energy heating up a resistor. But yes, that, that, no, they, they keep them very simple. Don't suppose in your travels you've come across a GU10 LED where the power supply doesn't suck? No, that one doesn't ring a bell at all. Yeah. I mean, most of the stuff we're building is for vehicles, yeah. all the marine world. I mean, they came out with a new product. Part of my job is testing the stuff to make sure what we're shipping meets the specifications. So you've got a nice little switch mode power supply and an LED, and there's a microcomputer hung on the end of it with one connection to it. It's an output. What's the input on this micro? It sits there, and this is a nautical light. It sits there and counts 20,000 hours of use and then flashes the LED when you first turn it on for a few times. When you get to 30,000 hours, it just keeps flashing continually, which means basically replace me. Nautical lights have got to meet a certain specification of light out. Over time, LEDs fade very slowly. Heat them up, overcurrent them, they fade an awful lot faster. Do you have any experience with infrared LEDs, uh, say for computer milling, paper or wood? No, not to the, to the level of power that you would need. I mean, at some stage I'd like to take some of these very bright LEDs and focus them with a, with a lens and see what, just what sort of burn capability they've got. One of the nice things that we have but the factory is that we identify all the PCBs we manufacture by laser marking them with, a, with an, an ID number for the day, week, year, and what the order they belong to is. So if we do have problems, we can trace back and figure out what caused the problem. We've also found that the LED, this uh, laser marker, is capable of producing logos. A nice bit map up to 100 millimetres by 100 millimetres, take a piece of PCB, paint it, stick it in, take it out, you've burned off all the paint where you want to, I mean, forget the laser printers to produce your negatives for etching circuit boards, and this is fun. <laughs> One of the side effects of working in this place. Any other questions? So um, let's say you wanted to DIY a headlight rebuild um, and convert it from a halogen to an LED. Um, in Australia, if you convert to say HIDs, you need to change the optics of the uh, unit as well. Um, do you have any um, LEDs that could just be drop-in replacements of a uh, halogen? Uh, no, I think you'd be looking at a set of LEDs. Yeah. As far as I know, we have not made any headlight capable LEDs. I say, the, the, the only one I've seen was this test one they built and it was just a tad bright they're aiming at the trucking market right. as an extra headlight. Uh, they built, I think, two samples and decided that it was just a bit dangerous. Shine that in somebody's eyes. I mean, these LEDs, especially those bigger ones at the end, are capable with a suitable lens of being a lethal weapon flash them from somebody's eyes, they're not going to see for a while. Flash them close and they might never see again. 
They, um, it can be, but they come with a warning label. Don't look at the lens. Don't look at the lead when you lit it up. We test them at low currents. It lights up, should be right. Don't give it full current, it's bad for the eyes. In fact, we've taken to testing things with the LEDs shining downwards and feed it through fiber optic. So you can say, yes, the LEDs lit, it's at full current. You don't have to fry the operator's eyes. The test systems. Okay, I think that's all we've got time for. Thanks, Thanks, Dickie. All right, um, thanks everyone for coming. That button. So today is an open hardware uh, mini conference. Um, while I was doing some research for this, I came across this picture here. Because everyone talks about the Internet of Things, which is one of those terms that I sort of don't like because it existed before some marketer discovered it and decided it was a good idea. But in some ways, they had a point. Um, Five years ago, the Internet of Things, if you call it that, was routers and maybe a few industrial devices. But in the last couple of decades, the last couple of decades, the last couple of years, it's amazing what they've um, come out with. Um, one that caught my eye the other day is an, a frying pan. You can't see very well on the screen, unfortunately. Um, but you can now buy a frying pan with a computer in the handle um, that you can connect to your mobile phone. Um, I guess you're going to smell it burning anyway, but who knows? So. The disappointing thing about this is a lot of this stuff is hardware that it's not open, I guess. Um, I want to get one of those fitness things, a Fitbit or something. All of them want to send your stuff back to the internet, which is really annoying. Um, it turns out there's one called an Angel, which ran a Kickstarter that I just discovered after it closed, so I can't buy one yet, which is designed to be open and accessible, which is really cool. So there are people that are getting into this market that are thinking about people that want to actually use it to do more than sell companies their data. So back to the slide. However, all this stuff wants to connect to the internet. And everyone's probably heard in mainstream media, has everyone heard of things like shell shock or um, the Apple problem that happened last year? There's been a few major ones that get in the news because they affect all the people that use all the iDevices. But your home router runs a little embedded SOC, and a lot of the gear that is open hardware related and used that runs Linux, they run little SOCs, little system on chips. Um, there's a processor and maybe an FPGA, a whole bunch of I.O. There's actually malware that affects some of these devices. Some that, uh, that first started being discovered in about 2009, I think it was the Hydra one. Uh, so there's a whole bunch of names, they really like having good names for this stuff. Uh, I'm going to post the slides later so you can follow up if you're interested. But basically there's now malware that will go from router to router um, and by implication Internet of Things device to Internet of Things device. So there's malware. Some of it is self-inflicted. Manufacturers release this gear with backdoors. Accidental ones, they're just in there for testing. They've been left behind. Um, the D-Link one was a big one that was at the end of 2013. If you had turned on, on your router access from the internet to monitor it, someone who sent the right string, which was some guy's name backwards, to a request, even though it may have been HTTPS, it would still open up a port and let you do stuff and things and not very good. And there was another one that came out just this week I discovered. Uh, have I got that at this or not? No, I haven't. There was a, a new one on Asus. I haven't got it up, unfortunately. Asus have a backdoor. So these backdoors come out so often, it's just ridiculous. So we've got all this hardware and people are just not paying attention. Now, it's a router. I mean, it's a, a thing. You're building this stuff. It, you're build, building gear to do all sorts of stuff that's not routing. Do we need to care about this? If you want to do really interesting things, I mean, you can do all sorts of really interesting things with small devices like Arduino, but if you want to do real processing, you need a bigger computer with a bigger chip. There's a lot coming out now that are actually open. Uh, the one I've got here is called a Carambola 2. The computer itself is actually the silver bit in the middle, the um, shield. The rest of it's just a dev board so that I can get to the I.O. and everything. They published the schematics. It's designed from scratch to run OpenWRT. Um, I guess the WRT node is another one that, well, by its name. OpenWRT is a Linux distribution. Obviously, you know some of these. The USB Armory is a new one I discovered very recently. I think it's still in Kickstarter, I'm not sure. It's all open, it's got the whole logo. This thing runs an ARM type processor, it's got 512 meg of RAM. 
It's designed or intended initially for security applications. So you plug it into someone's USB port and it can pretend to be anything. It's got half a dozen I.O., which means it's like, to me, a Leo stick on steroids. So I could plug an I2C expander into this and have an ARM thing running a normal Debian, not an embedded one, and doing stuff. So I reckon go have a look at that. So if you're developing open hardware on something a bit beefier, you need the software. The usual way to do it is a Linux distribution. Um, there's existing ways to do that. My slides are off to the side a bit, unfortunately. Um, you can grab Debian if you can make it fit. OpenWRT is very common. Um, people roll their own using this thing called BuildRoot. You can actually get FreeBSD running on boxes. I've had FreeBSD or NetBSD, one of them running on this. It actually was um, not too hard to do, which is quite interesting. Debian was really a pain on the carambola because I had to use an OpenWRT kernel and boot it off of the USB stick to the user space and app get would just kill it. I don't know what they're doing in there. So it's really only good for Debian on some of these things if you've got an image that runs off a of RAM and you don't need to install new stuff into it. So where I'm going with this, if you're building open hardware, you want to connect it to the internet to do stuff with IO, which is what I really want to do, but somehow I ended up going down a security rabbit hole. Um, you want to connect it up. You've got to think about software, especially if eventually you want to have lots of other people build these things that don't know about computers and hook it up to the internet. I want to build a weather station, for example, but I don't want to get it hacked. So I'm just going to use OpenWT as a bit of an example, but all the principles apply to any Linux. OpenWRT itself has a pretty good guide on securing basics. And I believe I've got that one up. Oh, there's a uh, Carambola 2, the center board up close. So it's running an Atheros chip. Um, that's the Armory Kickstarter. How are they going? 88,000 of 65K. So they've met their funding goals too. And it's still going if you want to, want to order one. And this is the OpenWRT security guide. So if you're planning on deploying OpenWRT on something you're building, read this stuff. I'm not going to go through that today because this is just an overview of what's out there. Um, so just apply the basic stuff. Even if you're not rolling your own image for OpenWRT, you can go in and do all the security hardening. So when you hook it up, it's a bit better than everyone else. To a certain extent, I think security and this stuff, it's you just got to be almost better than the next person in some way because new malwares are always coming out. So you don't have to be perfect. You just got to try and be one step ahead. And a big part of this is minimizing the attack surface. So out of the box, OpenWRT runs everything as root. And it describes a bit of that, and there are links to that from that security guide I showed you. Ideally, you want to be logging into your router not as root and then switching over. So that way you can connect it with SSH as a normal user and then switch over and avoid accidentally doing stuff as root that could compromise it. The other thing with that, it means it's if someone is able to get into your router and you'll say you're running a web server and that's not running as root and your web server has an exploit, it's a lot harder for them to get a root shell on your box. Turn off things you're not using. Um, there's no point running a TFTP server on your Internet of Things gadget if you don't need to serve TFTP from it. One of the main reasons for this is a lot of attacks now happen, they use gadgets as pivot points. Um, a couple of years ago, someone worked out how to get into a printer and use that to pivot back into a network and go around people's firewalls by using a gadget like that. And one way to make it hard as well is run your image in RAM. Now, this is not too hard to do. Um, with OpenWRT, you actually go into the menu if you're going to build it yourself and you just say, give me an init RAMFS image instead of a JFF. S2 image. What that means is that when the computer boots Linux, it boots the whole user space into a RAM disk. So obviously your device needs enough RAM, but these run in as low as 16 meg, depending on, or less, depending on um, what you want in and out of your image. It means when you cycle the power, anything that got into it will disappear. The downside of that, of course, is you have to manage configuration, but if you can isolate that to a, a, a separate USB stick or a different part of the NVRAM, then at worst you lose some configuration information and you don't have a binary that someone's planted on there. The other thing you can do is make it really hard for malware to run. 
because things can still go wrong with your other hardening. People are always finding vulnerabilities in web browsers and other tools. Uh, nothing will ever be foolproof, even if we try and make it hard, but we can just try and make it harder so that we're less likely to be the one that ends up on the news because of bash. So if you're planning on writing software to run on a Linux for open hardware, um, you, there's a few things you can do. There's a thing called address space layout randomization. Now the Linux kernel seems to handle that in itself already. Uh, I'm not going to go into that one today because I'm still learning about some of these things myself. But basically it moves stuff, memory chunks around in memory so that every time you run a program, the code sits in a different place. So malware, because a lot of malware takes advantage of the fact that every time a process runs, it's always at the same address so it knows where to look for it. So every time you run it, it moves it so it's harder for them to find it and do stuff. Stack smashing protection, I'm going to go into in a minute, and something called executable page mapping protection. There's a whole suite of uh, uh, mitigations that are designed to knock out whole classes of malware. It doesn't actually stop other types of attacks, but again, we're just trying to do our best effort. So stack smashing protection, it's an option to GCC where you just tell the compiler to do something called a canary where it writes special memory at the end of the stack. So if you know much about C programming, whenever you have a temporary variable, it allocates that on something called the stack. The way a lot of malware and viruses work is they send inputs to your program to deliberately attempt to overrun the end of that, usually by means of a programming error where someone hasn't correctly checked the length of their buffer. And what the compiler tries to do is put code into the tech that someone has actually done that. It does depend on toolchain support, um, and also the build system support for your package. OpenWRT does have it, but it's mostly off by default, which is really annoying. Um, but you can add it in by, especially if you're building your own package for OpenWRT, you just make it a dependency on libsst, make sure your build system is using fstack protector and you will get that in there. No, stupid thing. No exec is a means where the system software can allocate in Linux types of memory. Some are designed for reading, some for writing, and some are for executable. And for a long time, there wasn't much of a distinction. Uh, malware writers used to use that to their advantage by getting data and turning into code and running it. It turns out now that they've been addressing that for a while in Linux and in other operating systems all the major operating systems have these type of mitigations, where you can mark the memory as saying, I'm actually never going to execute that as code. My, a lot of hardware, x86 has a lot of support for this at the hardware level. Um, if the code is written properly, then you can't just turn data into code unless you can get a root exploit. So to use this one, it's another option to the compiler. Again, you'd have to go read the manual to work out how to do it in particular. If you're writing assembly code, sometimes you have to take special handling to make sure that the piece of memory is marked correctly. Um, there is a program called CheckSec, which you can use to check. It pr produces a table of whether your binary has the SSP and has um, various other mitigations in it, so that's worth Googling for. x86 is pretty getting, getting, has mostly got hardware support for that and ARM a bit. One problem, oh, there's the URL. Um, one problem I've discovered is MIPS doesn't have hardware support for some parts of that. I'll post the slides up later anyway. So many of the kind of gadgets that you want to run in open hardware, like this Carambola, they run a MIPS SOC. Most of them have NX hardware support not present. You can get it in the 64-bit ones, some of them, but it's not there. Software support can be added, but that's tricky, and that's what I'm going to talk about the rest of this. Um, sorry? Just got a couple of minutes. Yep. I might have to just do the demo later. So basically, there's a thing called GR Security, which is a massive patch that a bunch of guys wrote that adds a large number of hardware improvements. And I've lost that one too. It's grsecurity.net. It adds a large number of hardware, a large number of security mitigations to the Linux kernel, and it will help support systems that don't necessarily support some of the out-of-the-box. Um, you can use it to do stuff like 
blocking programs that try to allocate data and make it executable when they're not supposed to. You can log behaviour like programs mounting things when they shouldn't and various other features. I would like them to implement NX for stacking, for, for the stack protection in software, but they haven't. Um, it's not supported on MIPS, unfortunately. What is supported on MIPS is protection, most of the other protections. If you're using OpenWRT, however, it's a problem. If you're rolling your own distribution using BuildRoot, you can just patch it over the top because it's designed to patch on a stock Linux kernel. It's not possible on OpenWRT because there's about 600 patches for hardware and for minimising the memory footprint. It turns out you can do it with a bit of effort and I spent rather a few late nights late last year working how to do that because OpenWRT finally lined up their kernel with the long-term supported kernel for geosecurity. So if you've got a 314 kernel in OpenWRT and geosecurity, you can do it. So just very quickly, cut a long story short, I get a stock, I get the GRC, GR security kernel, sorry, I start with the open WR I start with the open WRT kernel, I apply GR security, fix the patch rejects, fix some build issues, turn on GR security kernel config, test it lots. And that's what I'm in theory demoing. <laughs> But the gods have not been smiling on my computer very nicely today, so this will be interesting. Um, so, the other one. So, like most of these dev systems, there's a, a serial port connection and you can do stuff. Um, one of the other parts of this demo is at the same time I'm demonstrating running Linux from RAM instead of off of the flash. So TFTP boots. Demo A and just to check. Is that going to be going? Beautiful. Whoops, what did I get wrong there? It's a good start. And, oh, come on. Oh. Right. Whoops, that one. That one. Oh, where's the other tab? Close that one would be better, hey? There we go, All right. Awesome. So I'm loading that, I'm going to run it. So this is a stock OpenWRT that's just running from RAM that I've loaded. It hasn't got GRSEC applied. Let it boot. So pretty standard Linux embedded firmware on this kind of thing. I don't know. Um, I'll answer your question after because that's actually a good point. As in, I think I've got a slide. But. So, what I've got is a program in user local bin that I wrote. Sorry? Oh. Ah, yep. Um, this program called MWRMAPX, that just ran and it succeeded. And what it's actually doing is allocating some memory and telling it that it's executable. Now, we actually want to block that because it's not something you normally want to do. So what I'm going to do is reboot. And this time I'm going to load an OpenWRT that's been patched with uh, GR security. Demo C, sweet. Um, And there's a few things that I can demo in this. Waiting, waiting. Okay. So, did I get the right one? Yeah, so the first thing it's doing, before it scrolls off, is it's logged in dmessage everything that mounted. So if someone was to try and sneak something in and attempt to mount the USB stick when they shouldn't, or mount a loop back or anything, it'll get logged. So you can catch that in any logging system. It's also logging time changes, the way I've set this one up. You can see that time set, so that's actually NTPD and BusyBox changing the time. Um, so 
you would get a log if someone else that wasn't busybox in TPT changed the time. And then if I run that other program I ran before, all the source code for my demo is actually on GitHub, so you can try this out for yourself. Um, it's basically saying I can't try and allocate and mem map that's executable marked. So that's GRSec doing that. So if you've got an x86 system, you're in an embedded one, say using one of those Intel, is it Galileo, whatever it is, um, you can just apply it on a stock kernel and get all this stuff without having to go through um, weeks of trying to make it work like I did. But the patched one, I've got all the way I did it on GitHub. So I'm going to go back to my slides and finish off because how much is left? Yeah. Oh, all right. Zip, zip. Oh, demo. Uh, where's the next one? So it's not a magic bullet though, but research all these methods for doing hardening. And security is a, hard, is a, is a bit of a minefield. Um, I even got stuff wrong as part of this. I thought you could actually use GR security to get stack protection over and above SSP, but it turns out it doesn't add software support for that, so I made a bit of a fool of myself in one place. But if you're watching this and it, you're an InfoSec expert, you can take my GitHub and make it actually do things properly for OpenWRT because I think they need it. And they don't have time to help deal with this. They're busy just making it work on stuff. So thank you very much. Thanks, Andrew. So we have